Today, we're addressing the root cause of emotions and learning how to sit with our emotions instead of shutting them down. Welcome to another episode of The Mental Health Break. Morgan Beer joins me to talk about the importance of understanding our emotions at the root in order to change them. Hi, I'm Dr. Nafisa Sikandri, a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in anxiety-based disorders. I created the Mental Health Break podcast to give you simple, actionable, step-by-step strategies to help you prioritize your mental health. Mental illness can cost you time and money. Ignoring your symptoms will only make the problems worse. Taking time out of your busy day to dedicate to improving your mental health can lead to long-term health and wellness. In this podcast, each week you'll learn tips, tricks, and proven strategies to help you regain control of your life, all while prioritizing your mental health. If you want to improve your life, regain control of your mental health, and feel empowered, you're in the right place. Let's get started. Before we get started with the interview, I want to let you know that next Monday, November 22nd, 2021, I'll be hosting a live and interactive Transforming Fear training. In this training, you'll learn what's at the root of your fears and how you can go from feeling scared to feeling empowered. I'll also be answering your questions live, but replays will be available if you can't join live. You'll have access to the replays for 30 days. The training is only $37 and will give you so many proven and effective strategies and tools to take back control of your life from fear. Join me on November 22nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Pacific or 4 p.m. Eastern time for this live and interactive training. If you're interested to join but can't make the time, you should still register and then access the replays for 30 days. To register, visit transforminganxiety.com fear. Today, I'm joined by Morgan Beard, who will talk to us about getting to the root cause of our emotions. Let me briefly introduce her before I bring her on. Morgan received her BA in Visual and Media Studies from Duke University in 2012 and her MPS in Art Therapy from the School of Visual Arts in New York City in 2017. As an art therapist in New York, she worked in a public elementary school, an adult inpatient psychiatric unit, and a 183-bed nursing home. Her life came to a screeching halt after burning out in pursuit of licensure and entering another major depressive episode. So hi, Morgan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I just introduced you a little bit and shared a little bit about your background, but can you tell me a little bit more about what got you interested in mental health and uh, just the work that you do? Absolutely. Yeah. So I don't think that my interest in mental health was necessarily uh, (laughs) by choice. I was... um, I've been a, a sufferer from uh, depression and anxiety since I was about age 13, and I'm 31 now. <laughs> um, and it's still definitely a part of my life and something that, um, like many other people, I'm actively managing. But my uh, my decision to be on the practitioner side uh, really came out of a desire to help people in a way that was creative and you know spoke to my creative background. Uh, So I went into a master's program for art therapy, which art therapy is essentially combining psychotherapy. So just, you know, regular talk therapy that I think most people are familiar with, uh, with the creative process, the art making process. And that could be through any number of media, painting, drawing, collage, whatever. Um, And I actually burnt out doing that. I got that master's degree and I Uh, took a job out of grad school working at a nursing home. And that was a really difficult population to work with. Um, It was a really difficult setting working with low functioning, um, low functioning residents. And I burnt out myself. I felt like, oh my God, I'm back in the throes of my depression and anxiety. And I quit that job and then uh, moved across the country to Los Angeles where I am now. And became a creative life coach. And through through doing that, I work with people who are, yes, often struggling with depression and anxiety, but they're much higher functioning than the clients that I was seeing as a therapist. And the orientation is more toward helping people meet goals that they set, helping them be more proactive in their lives, but also 
as a product of that, you have to dig into um, what are the underlying emotions, uh, the past experiences that kind of keep you stuck in in patterns that you don't want to have, patterns that are uh, ultimately getting in the way of you meeting those goals. So interesting. And and I was a school psychologist for many years, so I can understand the burning out when you're working with very difficult uh, cases. What did art therapy teach you about just mental health issues in general? So much. I honestly feel like no matter what I did for the rest of my life, even if it wasn't art therapy and it turned out not to be art therapy, that it was the most useful education that I could have ever gotten. Um, because it really taught me about mental health specifically that everything occurs on this spectrum. Um, I One of my favorite settings to work in was I worked on an inpatient psych unit with adults. And so these are more acute cases, um, meaning their their stays are shorter and, and they have often like a combination of different uh, diagnoses, some of them much more challenging and, and you know, much more kind of reality compromising than others. You know, there are people with schizophrenia, but then there are also people with, um, you know, anxiety, depression, not to say that anything is worse or better, but it, in terms of the treatment outcomes, some are trickier than others. Um, and so understanding that someone isn't either sick or healthy um, and you're you're just kind of put in that black or white category we all struggle with varying degrees of symptoms that are clustered into these diagnoses um, purely for uh, like I said diagno diagnostic and treatment reasons yes from the clinical standpoint it's helpful to say okay this is a person with chronic depression who also struggles with, um, you know, reality orientation or whatever, but everyone is a person and everyone is a person that is a product of their collection of experiences and, um, you know, predispositions and, and ultimately in order to get anywhere with anyone, you have to listen to them and what is their experience and treat them like they're the expert of their own lives, not that you're this fancy person wearing a white coat or holding a paintbrush telling them how they should live their lives. It's it's really creating a climate where they can open up and unfold in whatever way that they might need to in order to kind of access something deeper. And that that accessing of something deeper is where the movement occurs, where the shifts occur. Um, where the realizations occur that allow someone to let go of a behavior that's not helpful or make a connection with someone else that allows them to feel a sense of worthiness or belonging. And for depression, especially that really, that really comes up again and again. It's something that we all, we all need. Definitely. And I know with art therapy, we're trying to get to the root because our subconscious allows us to express ourselves creatively differently than when we're verbalizing our feelings. So since we're today, we're talking about the root causes of emotions, uh, depression, anxiety, whatever the issue is. And I like that you say that we're on a spectrum because it's not a black and white. It's not that you don't have anxiety and you do, or you do. It's you can fall somewhere on the spectrum depending on how high you are determines how debilitating it can be. So I like that, uh, the spectrum, I, I use that all the time myself, because there are people like you and I could fall somewhere on a different spectrum, right, depending on where we are and in different times of our lives. And so some days I might be higher on the spectrum than you or whatever. It's just, yes. it's just a matter of normalizing that, that it's not, like you said, we're either healthy or unhealthy. But in my work with, I specialize in anxiety disorders, mm -hmm. and I uh focus on the root causes of anxiety for long-term management, because I know there's a mm -hmm. lot of Band-Aid approach. Let's just take some deep breaths and that's going to help you. Well, that's going to help you in that moment, but it's not going to help you manage anxiety. Right. How are you going to create long-term control so that it's not you're in control and it's, it's not controlling you? So can you talk a little bit about some of the root causes of uh, mental health issues and then what we can do about it? Yeah, I, I I'm so glad that you called out that that kind of band-aiding uh, that we often do, 
where it's like, okay, it helps you focus on the short term of like, okay, I'm, if I have anxiety, I'm looking at, okay, so the symptom I'm experiencing might be a shortness of breath. So if I take deeper breaths, you know, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm dealing with that and I'm going, okay, I can get through this moment and reduce this symptom. That elimination of the symptom is kind of analogous to, let's say that you're someone with chronic pain. You can take an Advil every four hours for the rest of your life <laughs> and not experience that symptom, but you don't benefit then from a deeper investigation of, well, what's actually causing this pain? What's what's the misalignment in my body um, that is making my nervous system or my my nerves pick up ouch there's pain here there's something to look at like to me the root of dealing with any of these mental health issues or really any kind of goal or stumbling block or thing that you want to understand better in your life i think we often don't go to the root and for me the root is in the body when we look at anxiety we might attach it to racing thoughts or something going on up here, there also is something pinging us continually that's saying like, pay attention to this, pay att or something's wrong, something might be wrong. And we can pinpoint where that feeling is in the body, where that little alarm is going off. Yes, sometimes we want to slow it down by taking deep breaths. Uh, we want to comfort it with uh, something that can kind of alleviate the physical feeling. But we also want to be with it and experience it for what it is instead of just trying to get it to go away. Because anxiety is something where the more that you avoid it, the more that you kind of try to turn the other way, uh, act like it's not going on, the less tolerance you have for feeling that feeling. It, since it's fear-based and connected to this idea that I might be inadequate somehow. There might be a, a T I'm not crossing or an I I'm not dotting. It's this false alarm. So if you can get to a place where you can tolerate the physical sensation in your body um, and just be with yourself as you these alarms go off without necessarily directing all your attention to how do I shut off the alarm or how do I just alleviate the physical symptom. Over time, it develops or strengthens this muscle of, I can handle this feeling. And that idea of, I can handle X, Y, or Z, that actually builds up a confidence that then arms you to actually kind of meet, meet your anxiety. And then eventually you develop the idea that with practice, oh, anything that comes up, I can be present with it. And just meet it. It doesn't have to topple me. You're right. And that we're, as a society, taught to numb ourselves, like take the Advil for the pain instead of looking at why. And for a lot of people with chronic pain, what they don't realize is there is a mental health aspect to it. Because when we're stressed, when we're tense, we hold our body a certain way that's going to perpetuate our pain. And if we learn how to manage the mental health part of it, we can uh, have a deeper, a, a calmer um sense of like we relieve the pain symptoms but also with numbing ourselves and running away from our emotions it's like we're taught oh my gosh you have a, a racing thought shut it down right away if you're if you're feeling anxiety take a pill right away and calm that down instead of just sitting with our emotions and actually feeling the feelings because the our body is always trying to communicate with us but we've learned to run away from it instead of sit with it because if it was our toddler screaming all the time, we're not going to run away every time they have a tantrum, right? We're going to sit down and try and figure out what's going on with this kid. Why is he having these issues? And so it's really important for us to sit and, and, and be okay with our emotions and not try and hide it and or run away from it or numb it in some way. Um, but mm -hmm. also, can you talk a little bit about the cost to not addressing the root mm. cause? the cost to not sitting with it and what that can have, the kind of impact that can have on your quality of your life. Yeah. So if like that screaming toddler, you just kind of turn the other way and plug your ears and go like, la, 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 la. Chances are they're going to get louder. It's not going to just go away and never be a problem again. And so that that chronic pain, that sense of panic, 
as you try to turn a blind eye to it kind of generally rises um it doesn't it doesn't make the problem go away or alleviate anything it just it kind of exacerbates the problem and i think that we also tend to in in our society implicitly view the emotional channel as opposed to like the physical channel as being less worthy or secondary in, in a way but i think that all of those different avenues through which we can examine ourselves or or understand what's happening with us they're all equal and they're often all pointing the same way um so something that's coming up in your emotional life and coming up in your physical life they're often connected and we can use each of those different channels as a way to access okay what is what is the root issue here if you are organizing your physical structure and your emotional structure so to speak around avoiding something instead of moving through it and inquiring within about it you're actually still organizing yourself around that thing so you kind of bring it with you everywhere you go if you're organized around avoiding it because you kind of just encase it around yourself you know it's like if you have a a wound that is infected and you just kind of try to cover it up it's like you're not gonna that, if you just can't see it on the surface that infection isn't gonna go away it's kind of fester um and so you really have to bring it out into the open air clear clear the foreign particles um and kind of just give it time to heal but it does feel uncomfortable when that wound is in an exposed state but that's absolutely necessary for the healing. That's so true. I have uh, what people don't realize when it comes to mental health is they think that if I ignore it, it's going to go away. But it, really, the reality is it's only going to get worse and you're not ever going to get over it just by ignoring it. Uh, it does fester like a wound. I mean, even with like, take PTSD, for example, I had a patient that decided at the age of 82 to finally address some sexual abuse she experienced in 19. So for over 60 years, she suffered. She tried to avoid it, but it affected every single thing she did. It affected the partner she chose. It affected the kind of marriage she had. It affected her relationship with her kids. Um, and finally, at 82, she's like, I'm so the, the, the memories never went away. They were as fresh as if they happened 60 years ago. Mm-hmm. Finally, her dad had been dead months, I mean, years, 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 like 60 years. Her dad has been dead. But she was as afraid of him as if he was still alive because he was Mm -hmm. the perpetrator of the sexual abuse. So I use that example in that we think we can avoid this stuff. We think we can run away from it. We think we can just pretend it's not there, but it affects every aspect of our lives. It's the same with, like you said, that screaming toddler. Maybe that screaming toddler is going to... uh, wear itself out and stop crying, but it will, your relationship with that toddler is going to be affected. You're no longer going to be connected. That toddler is no longer going to trust you. That toddler is going to have mental health issues. Uh, That toddler is going to have behavior issues. So your life is going to be miserable because you ignored the needs of that crying toddler when it was needing you. So that analogy can apply to our mental health as well in many ways. But um, so it does. I mean, it can be debilitating. It can def- definitely affect our lives in so many ways when we don't address these issues at the root. But also, can you talk a little bit about, since you are mm-hmm. you're your coach, you help your, pay, your, your clients, I'm, ha- I'm doing the same thing with my work. We wouldn't be doing this if this wasn't a benefit to the people we work with, right? So can you talk about yes. why people should invest their time and energy in looking at the root and really addressing it for long-term healing as opposed to putting that Band-Aid on? Yeah. At- <sighs> So I guess I want to speak to how, the fact that that banding is bandaid is really tempting. Um, I totally experienced this in my own life where there are options out there. I know where if I took this opportunity, I could be investing in uh, a, a better future version of myself, but we're often incentivized to take a short-term quick fix option because it's like, okay, avoid pain, increase pleasure. Um, And we're not as geared towards, you know, human beings evolutionarily are not as geared towards, well, why don't I 
uh, invest a little bit now and do hard work over time. And then gradually I'll see improvement. No, um, the, the short-term band-aid option is always going to seem more appealing in the moment. Um, but of course, if you find yourself continuing to confront the same short-term issues again and again and again, that's probably signaling to you on some level that a longer-term change is necessary. But I think that we we have a tendency to kind of shortchange ourselves, to um, to not prioritize those things that might not pay off right now, but will pay off tremendously over time. So, so hiring a coach uh, or going to see a therapist can seem exposing or intimidating or unnecessary at first because you're like, well, I, I can solve this problem with X or Y or Z short-term fix. And you want to try to, you want to try to take care of it yourself. Kind of, I, I have that like independent streak in myself where I'm like, no, 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 I, I, I want to handle this myself. I can do this myself. Um, but in reality, we didn't evolve to be in an individualistic society. We evolved to grow together, to be supported by each other, to belong in a, a tribe or a community. And so growth within the container of a relationship with someone else is easier. It's faster. Um, and in some cases, it's the only way to get effective results because what you're working on overcoming can only really be tried and tested in the container of a relationship. It's much easier to change the underlying belief, for example, that I'm unworthy. When someone else is giving me their time and attention, or when I'm showing with currency, money, I'm investing in myself. I'm showing myself that I'm worthy by putting my money where my mouth is instead of continuing to stew in this idea. I don't know if I'm really worthy of a coach or a therapist, or maybe that's not even, you, maybe you haven't even connected the dot yet that that's underlying why, you know, you're not doing it. I hear a lot of like, you know, I, uh, I can't allocate finances towards this right now because I'm doing X, Y, or Z. Okay. That's totally real. And, and, you know, that's, that's what's happening. That's the reality of their life. But I also know that there's this undercurrent of, okay, they're telling themselves in that choice that that goal they have, that improvement that they want to see is less worthy than to them than, you know, meeting our, our sometimes more basic needs that we have to meet, like paying rent or buying food or whatever. So I think that the reason that working in a relationship with someone, with a professional at meeting your goals uh, or getting to those root causes, it can access it in a really profound way and a really expedient way. Yes, definitely. Um, and and for now, nowadays, I can understand where people can't necessarily afford to pay somebody as a life coach or a therapist, but there are so many free resources. It's just a matter of, are you worthy enough to invest in the time that's required to listen to podcasts like this or read books that are going to inform you about your current situation. Or nowadays, you don't even need to buy a book. The library has a, a ton of free audio books, physical books. You can just go and download. It's just a matter of, are you willing to put in the time to take care of this issue and educate yourself? Because that's the first step. If you start maybe listening to podcasts and then saying, wow, I need to learn more about this topic. Let me just go read a book about it. And then maybe you start saving some money a little at a time while you're doing this. And then you can find therapists that there are agencies that can provide you therapy at a reduced cost. I know when I was a student, I couldn't afford regular therapy, but I had to, before I graduated, it was a requirement that I had to go to 50 hours of therapy, which is essentially a year's worth of therapy. And if I paid regular prices as a student, I couldn't have afforded that. So I talked to a lot of therapists and said, look, I'm a student. This is a requirement. I have to go to therapy. Can you help me? Mm -hmm. And people, and finally, I found somebody that was willing to do it for $25 a session. And at that time, yes, $25 a session was still a lot because when you calculate mm -hmm. that by 50, that's a lot of money. And so, um, but at the same time, 
I am so grateful for that opportunity because before becoming a therapist, I had never been to therapy. I had never mm. experienced what it's like and it was intimidating. And oh my God, the first couple of sessions were horrible and that I was so nervous. But then I just, it's just talking to somebody. That's all it is. And like you said, you mentioned that we are meant to be in a collectivistic society. Before we became an individualistic society, I would even say before 50 years ago, we were living in groups. We were living in, in, in communities where we would go talk to our elders. We would go talk to our neighbors. We would go talk to our teachers. We had people to reach out to. And then now we're like, well, I have a friend that I can talk to. How many friends are willing to sit and talk to you for a whole hour about just your problems? Because in a relationship, we're supposed to take turns, right? Let me talk mm -hmm. to you. Let me. And then they're too close to the situation to um, to give you the advice that you need. So talking to somebody is definitely worth it. But I mean, those are, there are a lot of benefits because a lot of times you don't realize how you're sabotaging yourself with your mindset mm -hmm. because of the limiting beliefs, because of the irrational fears, because of the depressive thoughts that you're standing in the way of your own progress in the way of your own success. So this is why it's so important to, to invest in, in yourself and the time and the energy that it requires. If at the end of the day, if out of this session, all you do as an audience member is write in a journal and start writing some goals for yourself between now and the end of the year, what do I want to accomplish? That's the first step. That's that that would be a huge win for you if you can do that. But also, I wanted to ask you about in your experience in working as a coach, what role does lifestyle play in the root cause of these emotions? I'm 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 like almost struggling to answer this question because it is so intertwined and so complex. It's like yes, of course, do the right things, try your best, but on the other hand, don't apply excessive blame or self-criticism when it comes to the lifestyle choices that you make. Well, when we're talking about root causes, that's definitely one of the components. Obviously, there's there's hormonal issues that are at, at play. There's chemical imbalance that's happening with depression. And for some people that are depressed, going for comfort eating and sleeping excessively is a def is a huge issue as well. So it's a matter of where is it breaking down for you? Not necessarily in a judgment way. It's mm -hmm. what's happening. It's like if I'm growing lettuce, I'm not going to yell at the lettuce or judge the lettuce because it's not growing well. I'm going to wonder is it the soil? Is it getting enough sun? Is it getting enough water? Is it, are there pesticides, uh, not pesticides, but are there pests that are affecting the, the, the quality of the lettuce? Are they, is it stopping it from growing? Is it, there's their root rot. So when I talk about lifestyle, we have to look at all of those, not in a judgment way, but in a way of looking and saying, what's happening? What's standing in the, in my way right now? Is it that I need some medication or supplements to balance my chemicals so that I can make those good decisions for a short amount of time. So then I can, once I address the root causes, because I'm functioning in a healthy way, then I can create long-term health. Or is it that I need, you know, I, you need support. Maybe you just need therapy. Maybe you just need to get some, uh, for some people, even just drinking enough water can be a huge difference. So it's a matter of not I'm going to beat myself up because I'm so tired and so depressed that I can't eat right right now. It's a matter of what's happening with me right now and what areas do I have control over that I can start making taking action. Maybe I can drink more water. Maybe I can write in my journal more. Maybe I can reach out to somebody, talk to a hotline and say, hey, I'm really depressed right now. What are some things that I can do? So it's just a looking at a holistic way of what's going on. and empowering yourself because I do I'm a huge believer that all of this can be managed long term we can be healthier mentally and with with the whole pandemic they're saying that mental illness is definitely going to be a huge uh, issue for us moving forward and so the more we can do a lot of people are very anxious right now a lot of people are very depressed right now and there are circumstances beyond their control and that's what happens when we feel out of control. We do feel overwhelmed and we don't want to do anything. I know my brain is like that. If I'm if I'm looking at multiple things to do, like even cleaning the house, if I have to look at, I have to clean the house, my brain shuts down and says no. But if I say, okay, clean the sink, clean one sink, clean the countertop, put stuff away, empty the garbage, just one 
thing at a time. And that's how I can uh, manage it so that I'm not overwhelmed. And that's how we want to approach it as far as mental health. One step at a time, not not everything. But if, if we dedicate an hour every single day or 30 minutes every single day towards our mental health, if that's even like sitting down and writing in your journal or meal prepping or maybe going to bed 30 minutes earlier, whatever, little, little tiny steps, by January 1st, you're going to see a whole new you. Yeah, I I also really want to underscore the importance of getting support from other people. And and again, yes, of course, the formal support from a therapist is great. But also just having an honest conversation with a friend about the anxiety that you're experiencing, uh, just opening up so that other people can see the real self that is in there, possibly suffering, that that can really touch that that place of unworthiness that is afraid to to be exposed. And then it's like we're all walking around as these people carrying all this stuff, working so hard, expending so much energy, kind of keeping it to ourselves. And again, I I I want to I want to like point the finger at just th- these forces that are outside of us that are incentivizing us to behave in an individualistic way and tricking us into believing that we have to do it all on our own for some reason. Um, and I think that the, you know, I never like to, to be, to advocate for like, take a victim position. But um, I also think that it is like what most people are experiencing right now is definitely, you know, an, an unnatural circumstance. And we would be, even if that, like, let's say that 30 minutes of, of mental health work is a five-minute catch-up call to a friend or even just a text letting someone you love know that you're grateful for them. Um, focusing in on a, a way of connecting deeply and using your – accessing your own kind of true self versus uh, what Winnicott says, you know, the false self versus the true self. If we can have genuinely connected experiences with, with our true selves being – connecting with someone else's true self, that can really give us a huge rush of that sense of belonging and a huge rush of that sense Mm -hmm. of like, I'm okay. I'm not alone. Um, And loneliness, I mean, loneliness is a gigantic mental health crisis. Um, And it's, you know, it's comparable to these things that we're very aware that rob us of, of physical health, you know, like heart disease, all this, like stress, loneliness, these are all gas pedals on all these other issues. And it's really not accurate to talk about the mental health issues in a vacuum from the physical health issues because stress, it's all intertwined. It's it's all connected. And it, it, you can you can decide to treat that as a positive thing because you're if you're dealing with your stress, you are pew pew shooting you're shooting at the the bird that is <laughs> mental health and you're shooting at the bird that is physical health and you will notice this exponential effect of implementing these changes what well, can go both ways when we're having stress it'll affect us physically but when we manage that stress and that anxiety and that depression we will see the benefit physically as well there'll be less body pain there'll be less fatigue there'll be less sluggishness mental fog Mm -hmm. uh, cognitive Mm -hmm. decline two a couple of weeks ago i did an interview about the loneliness in the elderly community but we're Mm -hmm. all socially isolated we are socially connected with social media but we're not connected and like right. you said, if that 30 minutes of a, a, a goal of a 30 minutes a day of focusing on your mental health, talk to somebody because a, there's so much shame with mental health there, or mental illness. And that if you like, I used to think when I was younger, before I knew what was going on, I was so embarrassed about my anxiety and so embarrassed about having any kind of issues that I, I thought if I shared it, people wouldn't like me. But mm-hmm. what I realized is the more I, I was honest with people, the more I shared who I was, the more connected I felt to people and the more comfortable other people felt talking about their own issues. Cause we're all, we all have a head, we all have a body and it's all, we're all going to have some kind of a mental issue at some point in our lives. It is not, there shouldn't be a stigma. There shouldn't be any shame. It is ridiculous that we have this shame to begin with. And just yeah. talking about it normalizes it and says, I'm a human being. I am having 
a moment right now, even like we're okay talking about our PMS and how we're moody and how we're depressed before our period, that's normal because we can say, oh, that's because it's my period. But we can't say that outside the period. Like, no, I'm just having a really hard time right now. I'm having a hard time getting up in the morning. I'm having, look at all the people that are struggling right now going back to work because of anxiety Mm -hmm. uh, related to going back to work. So talk about it, address it, do not hide. There shouldn't be any shame. Right. And that's like exactly what you said is kind of why I I really struggle to point the finger at like this or that lifestyle change because in my experience personally, you know, that has been held over my head like, oh, if you just did X, Y, and Z, you wouldn't be depressed. And it's like, I wish it were that simple. <laughs> um because like you said, when you're on your period, it's like, okay, I can blame it on my hormones. That's a concrete thing that people understand is happening physically in my body. But if you say, I just can't get up in the morning, there's always going to be one person. I was going to say guy, but I don't want to gender that person. <laughs> That's like, well, why don't you just get up? Why don't you just do it? Why don't you? Blah, blah, blah. Um, and it, yeah, it's a shame. It's, I want, I want everyone to have that, that sense of understanding and especially ourselves especially like cultivating not just not judging other people but not judging ourselves like actually taking into account all the factors that are going on that are producing this result of it being hard to get out of bed in the morning um and that's why you mentioned journaling and i think that journaling is so simple yet so powerful in terms of our arsenal against uh, depression, anxiety, whatever. Because when we write something down, you get, you're externalizing something, you're getting something out of yourself. Um, but then you also have, you put yourself automatically into this role of, I'm reading something that I'm documenting about myself. So therefore I'm this witness to my own behavior and I'm not those thoughts. I'm not those emotions. I can look at them through a different lens and then that that objective distance always gives you a little bit of a leg up or um you know a little bit of power over whatever it is that you're wrestling with it's so important to recognize that we we are not our emotions and our thoughts we have our thoughts and we have our emotions but we are not them they are just there outside of like not outside of us obviously it's inside of us but it's separate from us there mm-hmm. is a person inside that it's like being a driver in a car. Your car can have engine issues. It can rattle. There can be tire pressure issues. Those are not affecting you as a driver. You as a driver are not the cause mm. of all of that, right? Mm. You're witnessing it. You're observing it. And then you can do something about it. But you have to see yourself separate and say, okay, This is an emotion I have. It is not me. And that empowers us. And by journaling, we do increase our awareness and our insight. And that's where change happens. You have to first look at a problem and identify a problem before you can change it. And I know that when I was a teenager, I made a conscious effort to be my true, raw, naked self in my journal so that I Uh, I wasn't putting on a face. I wasn't putting on a mask. I wasn't being fake to myself. I never wanted to lose sight of who I was. And I really wanted to know who am I at the root? Who am I at the Mm -hmm. core? And so it was hard initially to admit that I had dark thoughts, that I was not always the the kind of person I I envisioned myself. I Mm -hmm. had negative thoughts. I had negative beliefs. I wanted to really challenge those. And that's how we end up becoming better. We at first have to acknowledge it and uh, and then we can change it. So going back to your 13-year-old self, knowing everything that you've learned in all these years, what would you go back and what advice would you give her after everything mm. you've learned? How would you inspire her? Oh, that's a great question. I- <laughs> I, when you were saying that you try to be as as raw and, and naked as you possibly can be in your journals, it reminded me of being that age. And oh my God, I would you know journal and pour my heart heart out, and then later reread what I had written and just feel so much disgust for like that that version of myself, or perhaps those emotions, um, which which weren't me at all. 
I think I had such a sharp sense of like what was right, what was wrong, what was acceptable, what wasn't. Um, and so I really, I mean, honestly, I, in this like totally unattainable way, I want to just go back and hold her really. I want to just like hug her and comfort her because I understand now just how difficult it is to be that age for anyone with any amount of uh, tools or insight or whatever. But I, I would really encourage her to try to um, distance herself as much as possible from that black and white thinking that all or nothing, like I'm either the worst person in the world or amazing. Um, and just try to get her instead of falling into to those judgments or trying to categorize my behavior as this or that to just embody whatever I'm feeling in the moment and to just kind of feel it out slowly. Um, you know, I, I, and also just to, to have some allowance for the fact that that's hard because that was never modeled to her, you know, by my parents, there was no, there was no course on, uh, emotional intelligence or, um, you know, emotional management or anything. I feel so much, I feel so much empathy for that, for that version of myself. And so I guess I would try to impart on her, like to have, have some of that empathy for herself and, and let herself live more in the gray area of not having to have it all figured out. Cause even at 31, it's not like I have it all figured out. I just have more tools. Exactly. And going back and, and and that's what I did. I would go back and read my journals in my 20s and my 30s and look back and go, wow, there were such innocent thoughts and emotions and feelings. And at that time, I felt like there were the worst things I could have thought. There were the worst feelings I could have had. But looking back on it as an adult going, wow, there were so, so there's nothing bad about them. It was just so mm-hmm. relevant as a human, as a 13 year old, as a 14 year old, as a 15 year old. It was just in the context of it, it just made sense at that time, but there was nothing bad about it. And that's looking back on it. That's what made me realize like, wow, there's, you do, you want to go back and you hug yourself and say, oh, it's going to be okay. This is not black and white. This is not world ending worthy, right? It's not the end of the world. So um, definitely. Yeah. That's good advice. Um, So where can people connect with you and find you? Where are you at social media wise? Where are you? <laughs> yeah. So I actually am, I'm kind of for myself stepping back from my use of social media just in this particular phase of my life because I'm finding it to be more of a source of stress than than it is a source of um, connection. But that being said, you can still find me there. Um, my Instagram handle is mobezy, M-O underscore B-E-A-Z-Y. And um, my website is morganbeard.coach, M-O-R-G-A-N-B-E-A-R-D.coach. Feel free to engage with what I have there. Reach out to me if anything that I said resonated or you have questions. Um, I, I really love to have to have those earnest moments of connection um, and to just, it's no matter how many podcasts you are on or, you know, how many, how much, how much experience you have or how much, um, you know, success you have. There's nothing that beats that, that sense of genuine connection that comes from someone saying, I heard you, I connect with this. I experience this. It's something that I think that we you know, we can we can lose in this depersonalized kind of way of interacting where, you know, you're listening to someone on a podcast talk. Um, and if you have any impulse to talk to me live, <laughs> I absolutely welcome it. Yeah, we think that just because somebody has so many followers or has uh, or six or has a podcast or has a, a, I don't know, as a coach that we shouldn't reach out. But I have uh, I know somebody that has over 2 million followers and she reaches out, like when you connect, contact her, she will respond to you. Like how is she managing and keeping track of all these people? But yet she genuinely cares about every single one of her followers. And it shows because she's hasn't lost any of them and she continues mm. to grow and continues to do really well. And it's just it's so inspiring that no matter how big my business might get. I never want to lose touch with that. Like if anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm, I'm like you, I like that genuine connection and I don't want anybody to feel intimidated 
reaching out or leaving a comment or making a contact or sending a contact um, email. So, um, yeah, it was so great talking to you today and getting to know you and having this discussion because this is so important. We need to really understand our root, the root causes of our emotions so that we can all be work towards being as mentally healthy as possible moving forward into 2022. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Getting to the root cause of your emotions is the key to lasting management of your symptoms for anxiety, depression, ADHD, or whatever you might be struggling with. As I mentioned earlier, I'm hosting a live training on transforming your fears on Monday, November 22nd, 2021 at 1 p.m. Pacific and 4 p.m. Eastern and answering all of your questions about fear. So be sure to register and show up live to participate. If you can't show up live, you will have access to the replays for 30 days. Visit transforminganxiety.com slash fear to save your spot today. As always, before starting any treatment, be sure to talk to a trained mental health professional and get the support that you need. To learn more about Morgan and leave your comments about this episode, please visit transforminganxiety.com slash 47. If you haven't already, you can show support for the Mental Health Break podcast by subscribing wherever you're tuning in from today. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or a five-star rating since that'll help others find the podcast. We have some great interviews lined up and you don't want to miss a single episode. Subscribe today so you get notified when new episodes drop. I can't wait to see you here next week. Same time, same place. Bye for now.